welcome. Um, there's actually quite a lot of faces that we haven't seen before, some faces that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, for those of you that don't know, we're having a baptism service tonight at the main church in the evening. So we had a sister fly in from Indonesia, a sister fly in from Singapore, um, and, and you know we got a brother who's out of the army right now. It's so a lot of random faces, a lot of visitors, and we're thankful. So if this is your first time here, um, we hope you are welcome, that you are encouraged, and that you are blessed. And if you haven't been here for a while, welcome back. And um, yeah, we're just thankful that we have this time together as one family, as one community. Um, now we've been going, we just started the book of Exodus, so we're in Exodus chapter 2. And so that's, that's the text for today. And um, yeah, so to get off into this, the question I wanted to start off with is, have you ever been let down by someone who you saw a lot of potential in, right? This could be someone that you either have a personal relationship with or, or someone that you are viewing from afar. Someone that you're like, wow, this person has so much potential to be great, and then it doesn't quite pan out. You guys ever had that experience? Everyone's kind of nodding their head. I know as a guy, like a lot of us think in terms of sports. And so we're like, oh, like, this, this person's gonna be the next great one. Uh, you know, they used to say the next Michael Jordan all the time, and then it was now, it's now the next LeBron James. And so there's all these people that we look towards, like that, that's gonna be the next star, and a lot of times it doesn't happen, right? Anything else? Any examples that come to your mind? People that let you down. Now they're smiling, but she can't say anything. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I, you could say in the world, world of politics, like in the States, way back when. I remember I was actually in D.C. during inauguration weekend for when Obama was first coming into presidency. It was a while back. Um, I just happened to be in D.C. that day. It was the day before inauguration, and I have never seen Washington, D.C. excited about anything. Um, but the whole place was a buzz, and I was actually at this place called Ben's Chili Bowl, a very famous uh, chili dog restaurant, and apparently Obama had recently been there. And like, I go there, and like, there's this guy with a car in the front. He's playing this song that he made about Barack Obama. It's like, Barack. Obama, it's like, it's, it's, it's a song, and, like, and, and he's like selling CDs and whatnot, and, and everyone was excited, and honestly, I think most people were kind of let down, um, just, just, just to be honest, by, by what ended up happening over those years, um, and, and even here in Korea, you know, we have a new president, and uh, for, it's interesting for me because on my Facebook side, which is where, on, unfortunately where I get a lot of my news, um, <laughs> all my quote-unquote Facebook friends are super excited about this new president. And I have friends that are raving about him and like, you know, totally like, like you know, fanboying and fangirling over him, um, putting up pictures of him and he's like his, his good-looking staff and all these different things. Um, and, and so there's like this, this side that's like super excited and they think he's going to like, like save the world, right? But then I talk to the other side, and like, there's a lot of people that are very concerned. It's, it's, it's interesting. There's different expectations um, based on different points of view. But uh, you know, there are oftentimes people that we look toward as things, as people that we think can accomplish much, and oftentimes they don't. Oftentimes they kind of let us down. Now, to date myself, um, and I'll, I'll go back to this later, but you know, growing up when I was growing up in the '90s and '80s, um, you know, there was an athlete called Bo Jackson. And Bo Jackson was considered like the, the athletic phenomenon. Like, you know, he was both a professional baseball and football player. And uh, the only other person who ever did that was Deion Sanders. But he's the one that everyone thought was going to be like Hall of Fame in every single sport. So they even made this campaign called Bo Knows, right? And it was about a cross-training shoe, that, you know, a shoe that you could use for many different sports. And be like, Bo Knows football, Bo Knows basketball, and all these different things. It's this Bo Knows campaign that Nike did. And uh, we all thought he was going to be this great. And he was a very talented, gifted man, but then he got injured. It was like this freak hit accident, which actually can be cured now, but it couldn't back then. And he ended up never really you know, being that, that end-all, be-all that, that we thought he was going to be. And interestingly enough, that line, Bono, is going to come up again later on in the message. So with that, <laughs> Exodus 2. <laughs> Exodus 2, starting with verse 1. Look at your Bibles, smartphones, or look at the screen, Exodus 2, starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord says this. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. 
Now when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river banks. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out, uh, he went out to where his own, his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating the Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that, and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill their troughs uh, to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule their, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rol asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard the groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Amen. Long passage, and I'll try to bring it all together, but just a reminder, for this year, our theme for 2017 is the gospel of freedom. We went through the gospel of Mark. We are currently in the book of, of uh, Exodus, and we are hoping to see how God is going to release more freedom into our lives that God desires us to be freed of the different bondages and oppressions that we're under. And really last week, um, I just kind of felt that, that, that there was a purpose on why God was leaving us in, in Mark, which to my surprise was really to an audience that was in heavy persecution and ends. The Gospel of Mark ends with this really awkward like situation where everyone is, is fearful and, 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 and you know, don't, don't know what to do. Um, and, and then we go straight into that, into the book of Exodus. And I, I felt last week that, that God was reminding us there are things that we are all going through. Like for us, there are different Egypt seasons that we might be in right now that maybe we're not even aware of. And the, the, the message from last week was God wants us to remember whether we are in or out of season, or whether we're in difficulty or not, He wants us to be obedient and to blossom wherever we are. To be exceedingly fruitful as the Israelites were in chapter 1. Now, to remind ourselves what chapter 1 ends with is Basically, all male babies are to be put to death, right? That is how chapter 1 ends. And this is a very sad moment, because basically Israel, the, the, the Israelites, these hundreds of thousands of people, they are, are systematically trying to be wiped out, right, by, by, by killing off all the male population. Right? So this is a situation we're left in, and then all of a sudden, uh, I, I, I watched Prince of Egypt as, um, I don't know, like, I guess uh, research. And, um, uh, but, but I only watched for like maybe like 15, 20 minutes because it got so different from the Bible, I got angry, I turned it off. Um, but but this, this was the scene where the baby comes out. And actually, interesting, when the baby is like born, his face is glowing, right? Like they, I guess they took that liberty from later on in the Bible, but it's like this baby with a glowing face, you know, this fine child that's born to the Levite and you know, his, his, his Levite wife. Um, and so Moses is born. And... Um, you know, it's in a situation where he is supposed to be put to death. And I don't know how, how she does it, but, but his mom hides him for three months, right? 
how do you hide a newborn child for three months? You know, I know we have some people with kids here, like, they're loud. <laughs> right? They make a lot of noise. Like, like what, what, what do you do? Like, you cover their mouth? Like, when they cry? Like, they cry louder when you do stuff like that. So, I don't know how she did it, but she kept him hidden for three months. This fine child with a glowing face. And, and um, you know, what, what would you see later, and actually I'll get to this later, is, uh, you know, they come up with a plan to just put the baby in a basket and float it down the river. Um, I, I don't know what that plan was, um, but that's what they did. So they put it in a basket, floated it down the river. Pharaoh's daughter just happens to find it. And, and then Miriam, this is the craziest thing. Miriam goes up to Pharaoh's daughter, right? And she's like, hey, you want to hire a Hebrew woman to take care of this baby for you? And she says yes. Like, this is boldness. This is a little girl going up to, you know, the, the daughter of a king and just making somewhat of an audacious, like, request, right? If you really think about it. And so she, she goes up to him and says yes. And, and if you really think about it, Moses, like, so I, I had to use this Hangwon phrase here. Um, so basically what's going on is uh, we have a brother that likes to say rip off all the time. So, so basically, Pharaoh's daughter gets ripped off. <laughs> this baby boy who was supposed to die is not dying and is instead being raised by his own mother, mother and Pharaoh's daughter is paying for it. Right? Think about that. Not only does her son not die, She's actually taking care of her son until he was like, like, like I guess, a, like you know, a young child. But she's getting paid for it. Hey, that's a sweet deal. And someone would say, "Rich people getting ripped off." <laughs> but, yeah, that, like, so, so this is what what turns out to be a very grim situation. Almost immediately becomes a glorious one, right? where this child is not only saved but ends up being raised in royalty. And, you know, I use the title Prince of Egypt. That's, that's the understanding that, that Moses was raised as if he were one of the own, I mean, one of the princes, one of the Egyptian princes. Now, we don't really know too much about that. Like, a lot of the movies and stuff, like, kind of make it look like he's, like, like childhood buddies with Ramses. And, uh, you know, it's like this, like, brother rivalry. I think there's that movie Exodus that came out a couple years ago that really played in on this. Even Prince of Egypt has this going on. Moses and Ramses, like, two brothers. I don't know. But what we do know is, she names him Moses, right? Now the Bible says this is coming from the Hebrew word Masa, which means drawn out, right? So, so if that is true, then this Pharaoh's, you know, Pharaoh's daughter gives him a name that, that, that says that he has been drawn out of the water. Right? He has been drawn out of death. And so automatically, remember, we looked at chapter 1 and things look super grim, things look horrible. And automatically you're starting to think, wow, there's something special about this child, this fine child. And so the question is, are we getting introduced to our hero? Right? Like, is this our, our protagonist of the story? And right? we're like, yes, salvation is coming. This is the guy who's going to do it. He has been saved. He's going to be raised as if he's an Egyptian. And he's going to have so much power and influence. This is going to be great. And then the passage fast forwards about 40 years. Okay, when it says, and time has passed, 40 years has passed. So now he's not this cute little baby anymore. He's like a man. Right? He's a kind of old man. I'm not even 40 years. He's a kind of old man. And so it fast forwards, and then it's kind of interesting because when you look at the passage, and maybe I'm just looking into it a little bit, but when it talks about how he's like checking out on the Israelites and seeing how they're being oppressed and how he's like trying to help them and stuff, the thing that comes to mind is, when I read this, I'm like, is this something he's been doing for a while? Right? First off, he it's very clear he knows who he is. It's not like he was raised as an Egyptian prince and he forgets that he's, that he's a Jew. No, he clearly knows that he is a Jewish man. And he clearly knows that his people are going through intense suffering. And he seems to have this desire to help fix it. Right? So much so, I put up Vigilante. Like, I'm thinking, like, is this guy like... Like the Jewish Batman. <laughs> he's like Bruce Wayne. He's like a prince. He's got money. He's got resources. Maybe he has a costume. <laughs> I don't want to get into it too much because I'm going to sound super racist, so I'm not going to do that. But, but you know, maybe he's like going around as like, you know, this masked man, like trying to help out his fellow Hebrews, and he's like running away. Because it seems like 
when, when, when the passage is talking about how he looks to his, you know, he looks around to make sure no one's looking, it seems like he's done something like this before. Maybe not kill a man, but definitely try to help one of his fellow brothers or sisters in need. And so you can already sense that maybe he has a bit of a Messiah complex, right? He already knows he's been named Moses, drawn out of the water. Maybe he thinks that he has a special purpose in plan, right? That God is going to use him, and God has specially placed him and gifted him and made him this, this, you know, this instrument of salvation. It just seems that, that this is part of his mindset. And we see this when we look at the passage just in this chapter alone. Three times he goes and he's like fighting crime, right? He kills an Egyptian who's, 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 who's punishing one of his fellow Hebrews. He breaks up a fight. He sees two Hebrews getting in a fight. He, he, he steps in and, and, and you know, stops it. And then later on, when afterwards, after he's kicked out of Egypt, we see him helping out you know, these seven daughters, right? He's helping out these women in need who are getting you know, harassed by these shepherds. And so we see automatically that Moses has a heart and compassion to help out those in need. Right? You can call him defender of the weak. Well, maybe that's what he called himself. I don't know. Um, but but you know, this was how he acted. This is who he was in many ways. He was someone who desired to bring justice, to bring right where there was wrong. But unfortunately, his story doesn't go so well. He goes from rags to riches back to rags again. Right? He gets found out. He gets caught out by his own Hebrew. They already, they already know that he killed a man. All of a sudden that news spreads and Pharaoh himself wants him dead, so he runs away. So he goes from being this, this privileged person who seemed to be specially placed for a special purpose to being someone on the run and someone living in the wilderness. He's basically just living out in the desert hanging out by a well. That's the story. That, that, that's basically how the story ends. He's just sitting by a well. And then he helps some women, and then he gets married. He's like, sweet. But <laughs> regardless, like, he's just outside. He's out of the story. And you see that he accepts this, because after he marries Zipporah, and they have a child, he names the child Gershon. Right? If you guys remember when we did our Christian identity class, Gera. Gera is the word for foreigner in Hebrew. And so... Moses is accepting his faith that he is now a foreigner. He is now meant to live just wandering around. And the position that he was in, that purpose that he had already been put in, is no longer. He's given it up. I have become a foreigner, a foreign man. This is the faith that he accepts for himself by naming his child Kershaw. So he failed, right? So again, this is a man of immense potential, of great learning, of great resources. He's put in a position where he can influence even Pharaoh himself. And he fails big time. This is a big letdown. The people that are probably reading uh, you know, the, the, book of, uh, you know, the book of Exodus for the first time, you know, first off, you know, this is the second of five books, right? So as I mentioned before, they already read Genesis. And the people reading this already know that Moses wrote this book. So you're like, all right, we're going to learn about Moses. And they read this and they're like, what? Moses is lame. <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> like, how is this guy the hero that we know? And so immediately, this chapter just starts off with massive failure. It builds you up. It makes you think that this is the man who's going to fix the problem. And then nothing happens. But then the way the passage ends is, it's actually reminding us of who the real hero is. As I mentioned last week, the story of Exodus is not a story of, of men rising up and rebelling. Right? This is not the French rebellion, you know, the French Revolution. This is actually the story of God coming and saving his people. In verses 24 to 25, if you look at how it's written, and you look at the original language, you can literally translate it as God hears, God remembers, God sees, and God knows. All this suffering that the people are going through, the cries that they are crying out in their prayers, God hears those prayers. God remembers the promise that He had given to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God sees what is going on with them. And God knows. God knows the pain, the suffering that they are going through. 
the way this passage ends is it's reminding us who the true hero of the story is. Now, he will later redeem Moses, and he will use Moses as his instrument, but at the end of the day, the true hero of the story is God. So, to just to very quickly, and I'll probably refer to this later, Moses is in a life of 40s. Right? You can split up his life into three sets of 40s. First 40 years, he's a prince. He's living it up. He's getting highly educated. He's getting gifted. He's getting skilled. And then he fails. The next 40 years, he's living as a shepherd. He's living in the wilderness. He's got this wife. Um, you know, he's got this kid he named Foreigner. So basically, he named his kid Regugi. <laughs> if you know Korean, he's like, Yo, <laughs> he called his team Foreigner, right? Um, so, uh, that, that must have been funny. But anyway, so 40 years he's a shepherd, just living out in the wilderness, taking care of sheep. And then the last 40 years is basically the entire book of Exodus Numbers, where he is leading his people through the wilderness. So he goes 80 years before he's actually that hero that he was meant to be. 80 years. But his life is a set of 40s. I'll refer to this again later. Anyway, so really for us, what I want us to really fix our eyes on today is, to whom are we placing our hope? Now I mentioned before, maybe there are, are people that we are looking toward. I mentioned that there was that the recent presidential election here in Korea. So maybe a lot of people are putting a lot of hope in, in President Moon. And they're like, you know what? He's going to do some great things. And he very well may. But brothers and sisters, do you really want to place all of your hope on one man? Now I know in the States, it's kind of the opposite. <laughs> Where like, people are like, what is he going to do? And like, it's not really hope that they're placing. I don't know. Um, but, you know... At the same time, do we really want to place all of our hope on certain individuals in our lives? God can use these people, yes, but where should our hope ultimately be? Remember, God hears, God remembers, God sees, and God knows. I think, like, really, this is the, the main part of this chapter I want us to remember today is that no matter what you're going through, whether you are in an Egypt season where you're going through in intense suffering, whether there is oppression in your life, whether there is difficulties, or maybe you're just in a state of confusion. You don't know what to do next, right? And I know a lot of people you are in that position right now. You're like, I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> I, don't, I, I just graduated. Like, what do I do now? When I was in school, it was easy because you just go to the next grade, but now that I'm done, I don't know what to do now. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people are, are in that situation. They're like, brother, I'm working. It's kind of boring. <laughs> like, do I just get married now? Is that all I do? This is like, you know, a lot of people have questions, a lot of concerns. And so, what I want you to remember is that God is the one who hears, He remembers, He sees, and He knows. He is the one that, like, you know, like, uh, you know, I love the knows section. Like, actually, the way it's translated in NIV is like, what is it, like, had concern for, something like that. But literally, it's just no, right? It's a very common word in Hebrew, no. It's not actually a very intimate word, no. That's actually super intimate, because, you know, to biblically know someone, um, man, we have children in here. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's literally to, you know, have relations with and make children like that that's that's the word that is used in the Hebrew Bible it's a very intimate word God knows and so what I want us to remember today is first he hears us but that means we have to be speaking to him so maybe that's something that some of us are struggling with maybe we're kind of like put God out of the equation and we're not really crying out to him so I want to remind you if you are going through a difficult season or if you are in a season of uncertainty Talk to God. Cry out to Him. Pray to Him. And He will hear you. He will listen. But more importantly, God knows. More so than Bo Jackson knows. God knows. He knows what you are going through. Jesus walked in this earth as a man. He went through every single experience that you have faced. God knows. There is no suffering that God doesn't understand. understand. There is no, nothing that we're going through that is too difficult for God. God knows. So 
I want you to be encouraged by that today. God knows you, and He desires that intimacy with you. He desires to have that closeness with you, so that you are reminded that He is always listening. He's always remembering the promises that He has spoken over your hearts. And He is always acting. Whether it's sending someone like Moses, someone who's been broken, and someone who needs to be fixed in many different ways, or whether it's just Him listening and hearing you, and speaking words of encouragement into your life. God knows. So brothers and sisters, rather than putting our hope into people that may ultimately let us down, let's put our trust in Him. Really, that's one of the main focal things, focal points of the book of Exodus is even when his people had forgotten him, you know, 400 years had passed, and many of them had really forgotten who he was. They didn't even know his personal name. That's coming in the next chapter. Next chapter, God actually tells them his name, right? They didn't even know what to call him in many ways back then. But be reminded that he is our hero, and he knows everything that we are doing. So brothers and sisters, I want us to be encouraged by that, to remember that, and to put our trust and hope in today. Let's take some time praying, and we'll let close for today. First, I want us to take a moment to just pray into um, what are areas in our life that we've kind of kind of put God out. You know, like, God can't understand this. God doesn't know what I'm going through. God can't relate to this. Are there areas in your life where you just kind of shut them out and you're just dealing it on your own? If there's anything like that, I really just want you to, to just pray into this. That, 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 God, that you would allow God to be part of that equation. That you would not face things on your own. That you wouldn't put your hope into other people rather than Him. So let's take a moment that, that, God, that, that if there's anything that we have not brought Him in on, God would show us today. Let's pray.
that remembers the, the many promises and, and, and truths that, that, that you proclaimed over us. That you see the things that are going on, the, the injustices, the, the struggles, the difficulties, whatever they are, you see them. And you know, you understand, you are concerned, you care. Help us to be reminded that this is the God that you are. You're not a distant God. You're not a God that, that's waiting for us to come groveling to you. But you want to come to our rescue. You want to restore us. You want to encourage us. So help us to really put our trust in you, our faith in you. Not in other people, not even in ourselves, Lord. Just in you.
You give all the good things and the bad things before you, Lord. God, in the midst of every circumstance and difficulties, through the good seasons and through the bad seasons, Lord, help us to put our hope, Father God, in you. Help us to fix our eyes upon you, Jesus, because you are stronger and you are mighty to save. So let your name be lifted higher above our lives, above this church, above this city, above over every nation, God. Would you rule as king? We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus Christ, we pray.